Hi guys, it's Scott here, and in this video we're going to introduce the concept of safety factors and explain to you how you should go about interpreting safety factors and even develop them for some of your own design problems. Where does this fit within our overview of engineering problems? We've already learned how to identify the real objectives of our problems via the office process. We've figured out how to locate or create our own viable options uh, to these problems using morphology method and we can select the best concept via a decision-making process. In this next phase, we go about developing a detailed solution. We're going to show you some examples of how to do that, and we're going to work on this a lot more in later year levels of design. And the first step sometimes in that process is to determine some safety factors. We can use these safety factors in our stress calculations to ensure that there's an adequate uh, level of safety in our designs and that there's a high probability that they're not going to fail. We can then go about communicating our detailed designs via engineering drawings and we've already learned some of this. So safety factors are used to help us design against structural failure. So if we don't want a particular machine or a device to fail, then we need to ensure that the peak stresses are less than the stress that would cause it to fail. That sounds quite obvious. So what we want to do is make our allowed peak stress, our design peak stress, some fraction of the stress that would cause it to fail. How we would write this is that our allowed peak stress over here on the left hand side has to be less than the stress required to fail our component divided by this FD. And the FD is our safety factor. And we're going to explain to you how to come up with your own safety factors for your designs. So how do we go about interpreting a safety factor? If we just look, for example, at our peg, which we've used uh, throughout this subject, we can see that one half of the peg, which we're shown here, is going to be subjected to a force that we apply from our finger on the end of the peg. And we've got a coiled spring in this design here acting as a pivot point. So this is the fulcrum. And then we have the end of the of that spring hooking on to our peg in this small recess here. And so basically our peg is a simply supported beam. We can look at it um, with a force here, a force going down here, and the force from our finger here. So how would we go about um, interpreting a safety factor or coming up with a safety factor for this particular beam that we're analysing? So let's look at an example of a safety factor that we might use on the design of this peg which we see here. So we've got half of our peg and we have the force that we would put on the end of our peg from our finger right here to open it up. We have our coiled up spring, our torsion spring in the centre here providing a pivoting point and a fulcrum and that's going to give us a reaction force. And then we have the other end of the leg of that spring, that torsion spring hooked onto our peg here, which makes basically a, a simply supported beam that we can analyse and we can also determine a safety factor for so that it satisfies our design requirements. So we want to design for adequate beam strength in this region here and that's going to be the focus of this example. So we can look at this um, from two perspectives. The first is looking at the loading. Now, the loading is not always going to be exactly um, what we design for in this peg. We're going to have some conditions where it is under less load. So this initial loading down here. So that's going to happen some amount of the time where it's just sitting there. And then we're going to have our usual loading, which is when we're just opening the peg up fully to put, to put it onto some clothes on the clothesline. And that's going to happen in the middle of this frequency graph here. And then we're going to have possibly some misuse scenarios where we try and put our peg onto a piece of clothing that's maybe too big for it. And that's going to generate a forced opening here, which may create even more load than usual. So we can represent that in this frequency versus force graph here, where we have um, the following loading um, frequency distribution. If you've done a little bit of stats, um, you should understand that. So that's the loading side of the equation. Then we have the strength side of the, the equation. So if we went and made a thousand pegs, they're all not going to be exactly as strong as each other. There's going to be some distribution of that strength through that population. So in the centre here, uh, in the middle of our distribution, we're going to have the average moulding outcome. It's going to have a certain strength. Then either side of that, we're going to have some variation. So if we get a really good day and the best possible mould, the, the plastic is at the exact right temperature and everything works perfectly, we're going to get an above average moulding outcome that's actually going to be stronger than the average. 
but if we have a bad day and maybe some humidity or maybe we get some bubbles into the plastic then we could potentially have a flawed molding process so the strengths of all of the pegs that we make we should anticipate is going to have some distribution something like this so what we want to do as designers is figure out what overlap is allowable between the strength of what we're designing and the loading that it is going to be subjected to so we should know that if the lowest possible strength here is greater than the highest possible loading that that this device is ever going to see then this peg will never fail if there's a gap between here but unfortunately we can't afford to design all of our devices to have a significant gap there so that nothing ever fails we live in the real world and we have to accept that sometimes we're going to have um, an extreme loading condition combined with maybe a poorer strength um, item and there's going to have to be some level of failure that we're going to tolerate so this is what these two curves generally look like in the real world where we have to accept that um, some of the parts that we manufacture might experience this extreme loading and might be subject to failure. It's not economical for us to design it so that nothing will ever fail. So how do we take a safety factor, a single number, from looking at these two graphs? Well, the common way to do it is to take the maximum predictable loading so this is the standard usage of the peg where we open up to its full extension but not beyond. And then we compare that to the minimum predictable strength that we anticipate. So we take this from the material property data that we're using to design the peg and the geometric information. So if we read off this number here and this number here, then this is how we come up with our safety factor. So our safety factor is going to be the strength divided by the load. A more common way to write this is that our allowable stress or our design stress needs to be equal to or less than the stress which would cause failure divided by our safety factor which is this FD. So let's take a look now at how we go about selecting a safety factor and there's a standardized process that we can go through to follow a recipe basically to come up with a safety factor that is appropriate to our particular design problem.